Good morning and welcome to the Automation Morning Show for Monday, November 6th, 2023. My name is Sean Tierney from Insights in Automation and I hope your Monday is off to a great start. And if you don't know, this is a show where we talk about what's new and happening in industrial automation. And before we get started, I want to check the control board here, make sure everything is up and running. We do have the chat open if you want to say hi. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and get started today. And uh, first up is a reminder that if you do enjoy these morning shows, then please give us a like, a sub, and a share. It is the fuel that keeps us on the air. And with that, I also want to thank our sponsor, Siemens. Their Integrated Control Panel Symposium is tomorrow, and um, I will be there. I will be presenting. It's a virtual event, so you can tune in from anywhere. And um, I will be on from, let's see here, I will be on twice, talking about trends in industrial automation at 9.15 and at 1.15. I'll also be live in the chat. Um, and uh, if you're interested in this, please use the link over at, um, you can see the ads here, please use one of the links over at theautomationblog.com, automate.news to sign up, to let, let them know how much you appreciate us telling you about their event. And this event is really about control panels, even though I'm going to be talking about industrial automation trends. You know, they have uh, transforming uh, panels, they have uh, uh, labor-saving uh, devices, they have UL508A, you can see everything here. A lot of these are repeated, just like my session will be twice. So um, you can catch, uh, catch um, you know, if you only have the afternoon available, only have the morning available, you can typically catch whatever you want to see. And... Uh, Probably, you know, if you had to pick one, I would pick one of the ones on the control panels um, because you can always hear from me every morning on the Automation Morning Show. But with that, I want to thank Siemens for sponsoring this morning's show. And uh, from there, we go over to our first press release. And this one is um, that Siemens is investing more than $500 million in U.S. manufacturing. Now, we've covered this a lot lately, including the $220 million that they uh, plan to do uh, invest in rail manufacturing right here in the USA. Very cool. And um, the, what's new here, though, is $150 million investment in Dallas-Fort Worth production of critical electrical infrastructure equipment. They're saying this is stuff for data centers and for artificial intelligence things. But uh, in any case, we've seen a lot of companies investing in manufacturing in Texas. Very interesting. A lot in El Paso. But in any case, um, this is part of $2 billion that Siemens is investing around the world. And we love, seeing, uh, we love seeing companies investing in local manufacturing and not shipping everything from one lo little location to everywhere in the world, right? So uh, very interesting stuff there and a good time to live in Texas, apparently. But in any case, from there, we go over to Rock Automation and they had a case study about a North American utility that wanted to improve their cybersecurity, especially post the whole uh, Colonial Pipeline issue and Oldsmar issue attacks. Um, they were very concerned. They were like, are we going to be next? So they contacted Rockwell. And the process Rockwell went through with them, I'll just read through the bullets here. It's an interesting case study. But the first thing they did, and probably the first thing you always want to do, is an asset inventory. You need to know what's connected to the network. And typically, the people in the plant, they know everything that's connected. But it's good just to go through every panel and double check and make sure, right? And uh, the next thing is... Um, the secure the network via network segmentation. Now on the show, we've talked a lot about zones and conduits and 62443. We actually have next week coming up, we'll be talking to Red Lion about uh, zones and conduits and their uh, RA10C um, on the podcast. We also have, um, we've had uh, ISA on talking about 62443 before. We also have them coming back on and talk about ISA secure. So um, we've been covering this a lot, and that's a very important piece. So understanding that's really key to securing your OT network. And then uh, they talk about virtualizing their industrial data center. So if you have servers, maybe you have SCADA servers or data historians, right? Virtualizing them is something you really should take a look at because if everything's stalled on a, on a, on a bare metal system and it gets hacked and you have to rebuild it, wouldn't it be nice if you had those systems virtualized instead of just backed up? A lot of times when you back up a server, restoring that has to go to the same exact hardware, right? And it can be difficult to learn how to do the system prep and all that kind of stuff to make it a little bit less hardware um, dependent. And so when you go to virtualization, right, then you can not only back up the server because it's running virtually, but you can also run multiple servers redundantly, like in a backup, right? So very important uh, thing uh, there. 
to consider also uh, network perimeter security, network perimeter security. I guess I didn't have enough coffee this morning with a DMZ, right? Extremely important. I know a lot of people like to connect the OT network to the IT network and then, or to the office network and then connect it through a firewall to the cloud. But that is not a best practice. As a matter of fact, that is, um, that is actually a recipe for disaster because your office network is not the most secure network. And, and if it gets hacked, what do you lose? All the emails are on some server somewhere. So you really don't lose too much, right? In many cases, but your OT network, if that goes down, you could lose a million dollars a day, right? Depending on the size of your facility. So in any case, having that industrial DMZ, and of course we talk about zero trust a lot, right? You do not want any packets coming through that DMZ that are not specifically and explicitly allowed for a, a particular purpose, okay? So, and then the last thing here, they said, um, extra security measures. So they added a active monitoring system. In this case, they were using Rockless partner product uh, from Clarity, which we've talked about before. But in any case, yeah, having active monitoring to detect those breaches is very important as well as a final step to this whole process. So very interesting uh, article there over at Rockwell Automation. They also had an interesting blog about uh, embracing innovation in semiconductor manufacturing. And I just saw somebody come in here and, uh, oh, World Instrumentation Engineer is just said hi from over on YouTube. So in any case, embracing innovation in semiconductor manufacturing. Now, you know, I think we're all kind of tired of hearing nothing's made in this country, right? Of course, we either work at plants that make stuff or we visit plants that make stuff, right? And so I know I did that for 25 years, visiting places in the U.S. that actually make real stuff, right? And I'm not just talking about electricity and clean water and that. I'm talking about make products, right? And so um, in any case, uh, so a lot of people don't realize there's a lot of semiconductor chip plants in this country. I mean, I'm very close to Albany, which has kind of become the Silicon Valley of the East in a way. There's a lot of uh, semiconductor over there. And there's been Intel plants here in Massachusetts for decades and decades and other plants as well. And, um, you know, there are a lot of semiconductors made in the U.S. And, and some of them is for military because the military will only accept home in most cases. In, in, in any sane case, they only accept semiconductors made locally, right? You don't want to have your enemy making your chips. <laughs> Why would that make any sense? And vice versa, too. I mean, that's the way it should be, right? But in any case, uh, some of the bullets from this article, I think, apply to all manufacturing. Maximizing yield with smart manufacturing solutions. Okay. Who doesn't want to maximize yield? Everybody does. Um, build resilience across operations. Okay. Always a good thing to do. Empower people to build the workforce of today and tomorrow. Um, I think more and more as it's harder and harder to get people to take those old jobs that, you know, maybe were great in the 60s and 70s, you know, more and more thoughts going into, you know, not just having people come in for minimum wage and work like be a work slave, but actually give people a career that they can enjoy and they can be feel like they're part of a team and actually make a real difference, right? And then finally we have, oh, I shouldn't say finally, but then number four is drive sustainability by targeting inefficiencies, right? With Especially with the price of energy going way up. I mean, driving out all those inefficiencies and all that waste, it's always a good idea, but when the price of electricity goes up, it's even a better idea, right? And I think, and that, that was it for that article. So another good article over at Rockwell's website. From there, we go over to Metla Toledo, and they have a, uh, a case study about their partnership with Rockwell. And they are a silver technology partner. They've been a partner with Rockwell for I don't know how long. I know in the early 90s, I worked with somebody from Metla Toledo so they could test out their Jaguar system. And I'm not talking about the Atari Jaguar. I'm talking about the Metla Toledo Jaguar. And, um, you know, putting it on blue hose, I think it was remote IO, but it's been so long, 32 years. Um, but in any case, so they've been working with Rockwell for as long as I can remember. And um, they're highlighting here that they're a silver technology partner. I believe they're at uh, Automation Fair, which is this week. I think it starts today. I won't be there until Wednesday and Thursday. I actually leave really, really early on the morning Wednesday to try to get there for, I may not make the keynote. I think the keynote's at eight, but I'm going to try. But uh, I'll be there Wednesday and Thursday. If you're there Wednesday and Thursday, please, if you see me, say hi. I, I may end up wearing my suit. I remember when I went last time, I think it was 2016. I ended up canceling 2020. Well, I think everybody canceled 2020. I think it was virtual in 2020. But in any case, um, you know, I was the only media guy wearing a polo shirt. So <laughs> I may wear my suit jacket. I, I'm still 
I don't know which way I'm going on that yet. But in any case, this, this you know, a polo shirt and jeans, that's what, that, what I'm comfortable in. But anyways, uh, from there, uh, so anyways, they, they talk about all their products that uh, work with Rock Automation. You can see them there. And uh, we did have them on. Now, we do have them coming back on this Wednesday at 3 o'clock, 3.30 on the Automation Podcast to talk about IO-Link. But we just had them on recently to talk about uh, late summer here to talk about uh, their next gen weighing indicator, the IND 360. Very cool device. If you do any type of weighing, very cool device. Check this episode out. I really enjoyed it. Um, this device can even be like a little HMI if you want it to be, which is so, so cool because you get that verification right there in the field that the what the weight is, right? And um, I just thought uh, Jeff did a great job on this. And um, this is podcast 169 if you're listening and not watching, but uh, excellent episode. And again, we have another one with them uh, this Wednesday. From there, we go over to Festo and they have a new power up initiative. This sounds very familiar, but I didn't have time to check to see if they had uh, published this in the past. But as I was reading through this, it seemed pretty uh, new. So what's part of their power up initiative for to transform food and beverage machine building? Well, they have a number of products. We've talked about many of them on the show, including uh their motion series of low cost linear and rotier rotary access uh devices with uh, integrated drive motor and io link servo drives and motors io systems and controllers hauling systems and mechanical systems so i won't go through all of this but if any of that is in, of interest to you and you want to know what festo has today check that out we did have them come on our show and demonstrate how to import the cpx api system right in the studio 5000 so if you're going to be using that system, you want to know, hey, I configured this whole thing. Now, how do I get it into Logics? Uh, check out this episode. This is uh, Demo 006-D006. From there, we go over the Keyants. I haven't seen anything new from them, I think, since September, so a couple months. But here we have a, a new device from them. This is maintenance-free, reliable, static elimination product from Keyants. So I, I, I most people know Keyants from their sensors and cameras and all that kind of vision stuff but um here um this this looks like if you're listening and not watching it looks like a wall mounted fan but again it's blowing ionized ear to remove all the static and they're showing like a chip assembly uh uh process but there's lots of processes where you want to get rid of static right and uh, in fact we actually had a gentleman on les who's an expert in compressed air we actually had him on the show three times over the years to talk about different applications for compressed air. And they also have a way to eliminate static charges using compressed air. And it has all to do with the nozzle, right? And I thought it was just super interesting food for the mind. So if you're interested in using compressed air to kind of clean off like a lot of, a lot of um, surfaces, they'll, they, they get staticky, right? After, after they're product, produced or heated or whatever. And uh, they'll, they'll, you know, fibers and, and lint and all kinds of stuff will cling to them because of the static. And so they, this, this uh, podcast talks about how to remove the static charge and the, the debris that's collected on it with compressed air. Very interesting stuff. And from there, uh, if you're listening, that's podcast 64. And from there, we go over to our featured product of today. Today, we're featuring our S7 PLC course. We work closely with Siemens on this course, read a lot of books on Siemens PLCs, and this course is one of our forever courses. It's, uh, I know it's over 10 hours, plus there's over eight hours of bonus videos. You can watch, they're optional. And um, it's a forever course, so we're gonna be continually adding new lessons to it. We've had some great questions come in that I think will make great lessons. We're also gonna be adding some 3D models. So I've built in a 3D, um, in a 3D uh, digital twin environment, I've built the complete model of the, 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 what we use for the first part of the course, the conveyor system and the machine system and the sensing, all the photo eyes and inductive proxies and everything. And so I've built that in a 3D as a digital twin to what we use on the workbench. And um, we will be uh, including that for free. So if you wanna pick up that software, it's the price of a video game, you'll be able to bring in our model and actually run the lessons connected to, let's say, a PLC Sim, which is free with uh, TIA Portal, and um, be able to see actually see it moving, right? And we'll go back in, and I'm going to add some videos of that to the quest as well. So that's probably 95% done. We also have that same digital twin. We're having a company build that in a standalone app. So you can just install this one app, and it'll run. You won't need to connect it to a PLC or anything. That'll be free for all of our PLC customers who buy a, a cost on programmable controllers. 
and we are building, it's been a little delayed because of all the hardware we had coming in testing. We're actually building a, uh, a physical twin of the digital twin, um, that uh, conveyor with parts going down it and sensors and photo eyes and all that. And uh, that we'll be adding to this course in all of our new Ultimate courses as well. So exciting times. Again, buy this course, you own it forever, you get support forever. And, you know, some of the best ideas I get for new lessons come from the questions. So, you know, people say, well, what about this or what about that? So I love, I love it. I'm up there every workday answering questions anybody has. Um, they just have to post them right on the lesson. So from there, we go over to our Turk. Now, they had a couple of new things on their website today I want to cover. And uh, the first was the OSC variants of their IMX interface modules. Now, these modules, if you don't remember, we covered these way back, um, I think, in the spring. These are like for condition monitoring, right? So rotational speed monitors, temperature measuring amplifiers, and trip amplifiers. And uh, they have software that you can bring all this into and do condition and monitoring with. But um, the original versions of these modules, you have to set up with software. Well, this new OSC variant, um, these actually have rotary switches on the side of them, like you see on some programmable controllers. So you can set them all up just using those rotary switches. And uh, this can be great if you're an OEM and you're putting one in every machine and you're mass producing them, you can just dial it in and go, no software needed. Also good for if you're maintenance and you're replacing one, you know, easier. I mean, how many software packages do you want to have on your computer? It's so much easier just to dial in the right settings and plug it, plug the new one in and, and go, right? So really cool development in that product line. And then we also have, I thought this was very interesting and I don't, I can't say that I understand the complete ramifications of this, but they just added support for CodeSys to their Turk Automation Suite software package, right? So this is, you know, this not only allows you to, to interface to the M12 Plus, which we talked about those smart cables last week, but now it'll manage CodeSys as well. And you can do like batch uploading and downloading. So I, I read this and I'm like, I don't know if I truly understand everything this can do, but it seems like a pretty big deal that you can manage your CodeSys PLC programs uh, and HMI programs with this software and automate like uploading and doing different things. So very interesting there. We also had an interesting article from Pills. This is about IO-Link safety. And uh, they have like some of the first products that come out on the market that support IO-Link safety. That's a, a new standard we've talked about previously. And uh, very cool stuff. If you're going to be at SPS, you'll probably want to check out their booth because some of these uh, new products with IO-Link safety are just pretty amazing. And they also have a, an IO-Link safety master. And they're saying you can put these devices on any uh, field bus, right? Whether it's a safe field bus or not. So very interesting stuff. I'd love to know more about IO-Link safety. But for now, um, I'll uh, put a link uh, with this and all the links over at automate.news. Let's see a new, new chat come in. Frank says hi. Good morning, Frank. And um, yes, and he's talking about, he said this before too, they have to stop production at 2.30 p.m. to save money on the electric bill because electricity gets very expensive after 2.30 if I'm reading his uh, his uh, chat correctly. And uh, that's a lot of people People have to deal with that um, because of the, the peak costs of electricity. Uh, from there, we go over to ProSoft. And over at ProSoft, uh, they're talking about Wi-Fi 6. So... Thank goodness the people over at the consortium that manages Wi-Fi get away from A, B, N, G, A, X, A, N, all those crazy letters. I'm sure I'm getting some of them wrong. And they went to like Wi-Fi, you know, four, five, six. And so the latest one is six, right? Very easy to understand. And, and this article really does a good job, I think, of contrasting 5G and Wi-Fi 6, right? For high-speed wireless uh, communications inside of your facility. And so I thought they did a good job. It's not a very long article, but I thought they did a very good job doing a compare and contrast between the two. And of course, Wi-Fi 6 is it's just a faster, better version of Wi-Fi. They kind of go through some of the features, but it doesn't have a lot of the entanglements you might run into with uh, 5G. So from there, we go over to our guide that we're featuring today. As you know, I say this, I think every day, we have over 1,700 articles and videos, all completely free at theautomationblog.com. This year is our 10 year anniversary. And this summer I spent a week taking the 16 most, pop, most popular products that we've talked about and building guides for them, right? These are ordered lists of content from simplest to more complex. And today we're gonna to feature our S7 1500 guide. We have one on the 1200, one on the 1500. And uh, you know, it starts off with simple things like how to find your distributor and how to find manuals and documentation. 
And then it gets into more advanced things like, um, oh, I don't know, uh, using the scatter and gather blocks to format uh, Control Logics tags in a Siemens PLC, how to read a Compact Logics and Control Logics over Ethernet in a Siemens PLC with no gateway. You just do it natively in the Siemens code. And um, you can tell which ones are articles because they won't have an episode at the end. And the videos always have an episode at the end. So that's season two, episode five of the automation show. So in this one, there's uh, 46 total uh, either videos or articles on the S7-1500. We have one on the 1200 and we have one on Compact Logics, Control Logics, Micro Logics, so on and so on. And you can see all of that from, I don't know why that just beeped. You can see all that from under here on the guides, in the guides menu. You can see all those. Let me zoom out here. So they're all right there. So with that, I'm just going to, just in case my computer decides to make more noises, I'm going to uh, change it to the headphones here. And uh, from there, we go over to OnLogic. We have a new article from them. And this is about uh, selecting an industrial computer. And um, a lot of people like the small form factors. Why do they like the small form factors? Because the small form factors... Um, most panels are tightly, tightly packed, right? They already have a lot of stuff in there and the industrial computer oftentimes, you know, they're throwing something, some edge application on it and it's a kind of a, an afterthought. And so having these small, fanless, wide temperature range computers uh, can be a, you know, can be a, 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 you know, just a real benefit to the system versus a classic uh, industrial computer, right? Or a panel PC where, you know, you have to cut out a big hole in the panel and put it on the panel. A lot of times you don't need the display right there, right? because you already have an HMI. So uh, they kind of go through and talk about all these different options and choices. And in reading through this article, I think they did a great job, but in reading through this article, I was reminded that we recently had them on the podcast, P172, and they covered everything from their custom servers, right? So rack mount servers, all the way down to their tiny little industrial Pi computers, right? So Raspberry Pi computers. So uh, if you missed this, I know the uh, audio audience has eaten this episode up, but if you've missed the video on this, check it out. I had a lot of fun talking with, um, I think it was Jason. Yeah, Jason from OnLogic about what they have and kind of going back and forth and asking questions and learned a lot about what they do. They even do panel PCs. They make everything, um, they assemble everything and make everything they can right up here in Vermont. I believe they're in Burlington, so the middle of nowhere. But in any case, um, uh, I, I got to see a lot of PLC-5s at a power plant up in uh, Burlington once in uh, Man, I must have took a thousand pictures of all those MCCs. But in any case, um, yeah, so check that out if you're interested in learning more about them. It was a fun conversation. I really enjoyed it. From there, we go over to Global American. They have a blog on Mean Time Between Failure, MTBF. Now, we have talked about this a couple of times this year, but this is another article which if you have somebody new, if you don't know what MTBF is or you have somebody new, this really uh, broaches the topic from a different angle. And so um, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good article because we've had a Global American on the show as well. One of the things about Global American, they can do a lot of custom stuff, especially for if you're replacing something pretty old, right? You're like, hey, I can't get the exact mix and match I need. They do a lot of that stuff as well. Uh, from there, we go over to the videos. Now, there's a couple of videos here. It's video number three and four if you're looking from the left side here. And uh, these are videos over at Turk, and these are about the M12 Plus that we covered last week, right? These are these smart... Uh, uh, M12 cables that have like a circuit board built in, current me measuring built in, like condition monitoring built in, and um, send that information out via Bluetooth. And I really enjoyed the uh, the walk and talks that are always short and right to the point. And I really enjoyed those. And then it almost sounded like there was like a plane flying overhead because like the noise cancellation kicks in at the end. And then on the second one, um, these are always like a little, um, what do I say? How, how do I say this? Like a little professional angst going on there because um the uh, the qu guy questioning them is always kind of has like a little bit of attitude right and uh so but i always enjoy these you can tell that they're uh, they're good colleagues and they like working together but in any case um both of these videos were great so if you want to learn more about the m12 plus from turk check those out um they have some new ones we'll cover later in the week um from there i wanted to go over to a excellent video from sometimes it's a challenge to work with some of the vendors websites so this video I, I couldn't get the title when i pulled up the video but this is on the fisher l2t liquid level controller and i thought this demo video was very good so they go through and they show how this controller right so if you don't have a if you don't need a plc out there right you just need to control the level 
this kind of walks through how this product works. I thought they did a very good job. They have a dashboard up on the screen. They show in different things going on off. It's not very long either, so you can get through it quickly, but uh, they do a very good job of showing exactly what this level controller does. And with that, as far as software updates, we have an update for a Somatic, Cymatic, um, PCS7 V9.1 SP2. And then we also have an update for a Simicode ES V18. And we have some new manuals here. We have a new manual from Emerson on the machine health sensor and on their FLV axial control valve. And finally, in our other science and technology section, I won't spend too much time on this because I know eight o'clock is coming up here quick, but uh, I really enjoyed this article from IEEE, a bold new plan for preserving online privacy and security. And this talks about, you know, it basically it says, look, the companies aren't going to be able to do it for us. They just either, they don't want to spend the money to do it or they're incapable of doing it. And so how do we, how do we decouple our personal information from the data we're storing in their services, whether it's email, you know, they go through a lot of examples. We're not all, we're not all using AWS or some Azure to store lots of data, right? It's just the day in day out things like email and pictures and all these things. How do we decouple our private information from the information we're storing on these platforms. And then how do we ensure that these platforms can't share data about us either purposely or inadvertently? And they go through some of the, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, you're always bashing big companies. No, all these fines are public. <laughs> they're all, all these, all the things that they've, they've been brought to court for and been found guilty of, they're all publicly and published. So we, we, we can't assume, you know, it's a trust, but verify, right? You want to trust people, right? But you have to verify, you have to have safeguards in place so that if somebody is just being a bonehead and makes a mistake, you don't lose all your personal information and have your identity stolen, right? And that, that's usually how these things happen, right? But in any case, they go through this in great detail. I really thought it was a, a if you're following cybersecurity, you're interested in, in uh, online privacy and uh, being protected from hackers, I think this you'll enjoy this article I did. It's a long article. I actually only didn't get through the whole thing, but what I did read this morning, I really enjoyed. So definitely want to recommend that out to you. Now, I want to thank Siemens again. If you get any time tomorrow, please sign up for the Integrated Control Panel Symposium. Please use our link over at theautomationblog.com or automate.news. You'll see the ads there. And uh, really just thank them for sponsoring this show. Also, uh, if you have any news tips, if I'm not covering one of your favorite vendors, or if you saw an article that I didn't cover, please send it in. Sometimes if a, if a vendor releases like four or five, I will only cover one or two and save the, the other ones for the following day. Um, just so, you know, I can mix it up a little bit during the show and not cover, you know, four or five items from one vendor. Sometimes you can't avoid it, right? But in any case, please use the news tip link to send any news tips in. Also, I want to thank, we got another half dozen followers over at automation.locals.com over the weekend. That is our community where we, you can ask questions, you can post, uh, you can answer questions too and so on. So, and I try to post everything I do up there as well as at theautomationblog.com. And with that, do want to thank everybody who picked up a copy of my eBooks and uh, uh, video collections. Really appreciate you guys. Every penny of profit goes right back into the show and site. Also, uh, just a reminder that uh, every link that we cover on the show, it's we're over 140 episodes now, I, I put up at automate.news, and these links go directly to the article I talk about, right? There's no ad in between or anything like that. This is just a list of, of every link we've covered. I think you guys know the first three months are just one page of links, but then every, every link since then is individual, and those can actually be filtered and sorted as well. And like I was talking about, M, M, uh, me time between failures, MTBF, I was talking about that. I searched on MTBF and I got two results. That's how I know we talked about it twice before. Uh, so in any case, um, every link is over at automate.news, okay? No www, no .com. And with that, it's, well, my clock says it's exactly eight o'clock. So I want to wish you all an awesome day. I saw some chats come in and, uh, oh, hey, Dan. Huh? It's good to see Dan. How you doing? And um, thanks, Frank, and thank uh, uh, Engineer uh, for chatting with us this morning. I want to wish you all, again, an awesome day and encourage you to stay courageous and stay fearless. And until next time, my friends, peace. <laughs>